that you'd not do that. Um, but anyway, today we're going to do class 29. Wednesday will be class 30. Now, Wednesday's class is the first part of a class that we're doing in two days called Rational Functions. So it's going to be really important that you, sometime be between Wednesday the 15th and when you come back on the 22nd, you review class 30 so you can walk with, in fact, doing the preview exercises with class 31 is going to be pretty important for you to do. The only thing I want to point out, folks, is when we redid the schedule, we forgot to write in for the take-home quiz on Wednesday that you're going to get. It just says 26 to 29, but 24 is also included. That was a class on quadratic functions. So just change that on your schedule or make a little note for that. So once you leave here on Wednesday, we'll not see you again until Wednesday, April 22nd. That's when your take-home quiz will be due. You'll have a full week to do it. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at today's exercises. We're trying to solve these equations. When you solve an equation that's equal to zero, right, and it's quadratic, you use a quadratic formula if you can't factor it. So you got two answers for this one. You got, let's see, if I can remember what it was. Negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 5, is that correct? And this one was negative 2 plus or minus i square roots of 2. Okay. I want to do a little bit of algebra with you since we finished early today. The, you all came in. Some of you came in really well prepared and had your preview exercises done or looked at. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Let's look at how you can take your zeros and turn them into, take this polynomial and write it as factored form. So this polynomial function looks like this. Okay. This is in polynomial form. Once we get our zeros, we can write it in factored form by taking each zero. Notice that the leading coefficient here is 1. It's always going to be the leading coefficient in your polynomial form is the same leading coefficient even in your factored form. So you have a second degree polynomial that tells you you're going to have two factors here. Your two factors are going to be x take away one of your zeros and x take away your other zero. Now we're used to putting in numbers here like x take away 2, x take away 3 and using FOIL to multiply it. We're used to fairly simple looking things. Now our zeros are a little more complicated. These are irrational zeros. These are irrational zeros. And these are complex imaginary zeros. So when we put them back into our, our form called x take away one zero, and x take away the other 0, and we try multiplying them out, it's going to be a little more work than what we're used to. But you can do it. And I'm going to show you a little trick. So let's put in this first 0, negative 2 plus the square root of 5. So I do minus, and I just use some parentheses and put negative 2 plus the square root of 5. Okay, That's what it looks like. x take away negative 2 plus the square root of 5. And then what's my other one going to look like? negative 2 minus the square root of 5. Okay. So before we attempt to multiply this out, I want to just review something with you very quickly. When you multiply two conjugates, here are two conjugates. Those are two conjugate factors. You get the difference between two perfect squares. It's always going to be in subtraction. Your middle term and your outer term go to zero. So you square this first thing, you square the second term, and you put a subtraction. They all work that way, no matter how complicated they look. When you multiply two conjugate factors, you get the difference between two perfect squares, unless your conjugate factors have i in them. x plus i x minus i. You put a subtraction, you square your x, because that's your first term, you square your i. But what does i square equal again? Negative 1. 
And when you subtract a negative 1, it becomes, oops, x squared plus 1. So when we introduced complex numbers, it gave us the ability to factor the sum of perfect squares, whereas before with real numbers, we could only factor the difference of perfect squares. So now when we look at this first thing right here, even though it looks really complicated, the little trick is that when you drop these parentheses, let's see what it looks like. When I drop these parentheses and I subtract a negative 2, what's it going to look like? Positive 2 changes that sign, and we get minus square root of 5. Does everybody follow that one so far? Okay, the next one, can someone help me with the next one other than Amber? X. Okay, now here's the little trick, and you're going to get a homework problem like this. So remember this little trick. When you drop these parentheses, then what you want to do is you want to group these two together. Can you see that if you make this stuff in the green parentheses, like a big letter, like A, it's A, take away the square root of 5, A, oops, plus the square root of 5. Do you see that those are conjugates of each other? They look exactly the same, except for one is a subtraction, one is an addition. So if you were to use FOIL here, your middle term and your outer term would go to zero. So to do this, it's really a lot easier than it looks. You just square x plus 2, you write a difference, and you square the square root of 5. Well, what's the square root of 5 squared give you? 5. Okay. And you square x plus 2, the quantity squared. x squared plus 4x plus 4. So this comes out to be x squared plus 4x minus 1. Notice that's exactly what you started with. So the little trick here is once you place them into your factors and you drop your parentheses by changing the signs, you group the x with the first number here. You group that. It's much easier to multiply. You could still multiply it as you know x plus and then have 2 minus the square root of 5 and x plus 2 plus the square root of 5. It's just much easier this way. The same thing's going to happen here when you try this one, except for now you're going to get an I square when you multiply, and you have to remember to change that to negative 1. Okay, so you all did a great job on the preview exercises, so let's uh, use this. The other main idea that I pointed out to you is that when you have complex imaginary zeros and irrational zeros, they always come in pairs, always, always, always. If you know one of them, you know the other one. So often what they'll do when they give you an exercise to do and one of your zeros is irrational or a complex imaginary zero, they'll only give you one of them. And you have to be like smart enough to remember to include the other one, its conjugate pair. And I want to show you where that happens. If you go to, I believe it's number three, it's right here, number four. So turn to number four. Do you see the very first sentence says, find a third degree polynomial function with real coefficients that has negative 3 and i as zeros. Negative 3 and i. So it looks like they're only giving you two zeros, right? Negative 3 and i. But what comes along with the i? What also comes along as, it's, as the other zero, even though they didn't tell you? Mm -mm. Nope. I guess we'll work through it. Let's come back here. If you know one of your zeros is negative 2 plus i square root of 2, what's the other one? This is much more complicated than the one we have. Negative 2 minus i square root of 2. So if one of your zeros is plus i, what's the other one going to be? Negative i. Right. So you just change the sign. So when you read something like number four, it really says this. Negative three is a zero, plus and minus i are also zeros. You have to know to put that in because they always come together. 
So that's like something you want to put little stars around or write a note to yourself. Okay, so let's let's start back at the beginning. Just jumped ahead a little bit. Where's number one? It's at the bottom here. Okay. So want to start us off here, Amber, with reading this? In fact, mine looks a little bit different. Yours looks like this. Okay, so what kind of numbers can I get for zeros? So this is what you have on your, in your lecture notes. I'm just rewriting it because I forgot to change it. All right, so it says find all the zeros of this polynomial and classify each as real, non-real, imaginary, complex imaginary, rational, or irrational. All right. So first of all, if we look at x plus 3 times x plus 3, which as if you see how I wrote it, I, ha I had used a little um, exponent right there to say it has a multiplicity of 2 because it occurs twice. But once I wrote this word linear, I had to change it okay, to look like this. Okay. So what's 1, 0? Can anybody give me 1, 0 for this? Find one value of x that makes that function equal to zero. Can anybody tell me any one of my answers? What is it? Negative three. three. How'd you get that? Because there's x plus three. Right. You have you take your one factor, x plus three, you set it equal to zero, and your solution here is negative three. So negative three is one of your zeros. How many times does that negative three occur? Two times. Okay, so even though it's the same number, you count it as if it's different. So you have two zeros automatically because x plus 3, x plus 3, x minus 3 is a zero, but you count it twice. All right, how could we classify this? Let's start first with is it a real number or a non-real number? Is negative 3 real or non-real? Real. real. All right, so we've got that. And if it's real, is it rational or irrational? Rational. All right, so that's a real rational zero. Okay. Someone else? Uh, who gave me the answer negative three? Dean. So could someone else give me another zero? Okay, I, who did I hear say one half first? I heard some a half over here and I heard, but I heard this half first. Was it Ashlyn? Okay, so Ashlyn said 2x minus 1. If I take that factor and set it equal to 0 and solve, I get x equals 1 half. So is 1 half real or non-real? It's real. Is it rational or irrational? It's a rational number. A rational number is the ratio of two integers. 1 divided by 2 is a ratio. One is an integer, two is an integer, so it's rational. Okay. Okay. Someone else want to tell me another zero? Going once. Negative square root of two. So if you take x plus the square root of two and you set it equal to zero, you get x equals negative square root of two. If you get the negative square root of two, what comes along automatically? It's positive square root of two. Look. See, look, they're conjugates of each other. So one of the solutions, one of the zeros is square root of 2. The other one's negative square root of 2. So you can write them. Once you get one, you get the other one automatically. Is square root of 2 and negative square root of 2 a real number or a non-real number? Real. And are they rational numbers or irrational? Irrational. This is what got the Pythagorean society all in trouble. So they discovered square root of two. All right, Whew, now we got the last one. Ooh, that looks scary, but it isn't. Once you get one of the answers, you get the other one for free. So you take your, you take your factor. If you want, you can put it like that, set it equal to zero. So what must this one look like so that when you subtract it, you get zero? It looks exactly the same, right? If you do 4 plus 5i and you subtract 4 plus 5i, don't you get zero? If you subtract a number from itself? 
So 4 plus 5i is one of your answers. What's automatically the next one? 4 minus 5i, right, it's conjugate. Are these real or non-real zeros? Non-real, the minute you see that i, it's non-real. And these are called complex imaginary because of that little baby i there, zeros. So, what is the degree of this polynomial? If you multiplied every single one of these factors together, which I wouldn't ask you to do, but what would be the highest power you would see? One person said seven right away. I heard another little person say seven. Not a little person, but a little voice say seven. And other people are quiet. Would it be eight? Well, I have a seven going once, going twice. If you multiplied these two, what would what would be the degree you would get if you multiplied a linear times a linear, a square? Then you take a square and you multiply it by another linear. What would you get? A square, x squared, a cube. Then a cube times another x. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. When you have a polynomial in its infected form, like this one is, you add up all of your powers. See? You got seven different factors or seven factors, two of them are the same. So to get your degree, it's one plus one plus one, seven times, right? Plus one plus one, seven times. When it's in polynomial form, you just look for your highest power. But when it's all in facted form, and one of my students said something that helped the rest of the students. He said, I just count the number, how many x's to the first power I have. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many linear factors do you have here? If you multiply it all out and you don't square it, how many linear factors do you have? Linear factors means the factor raised to the first power, seven. How many zeros do you have if you count repeated zeros separately? You've got two negative threes, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hmm, funny thing about that. My degree is seven, I have seven factors, and I have seven zeros. I wonder if that's always going to be true. Well, we'll find out. All right, so we switch it up a little bit on you now, and we give you... This is what you're going to do for your homework. Now, I went through this in my first class, and during studio hours, one of my students called me over and said, what's the rational number theorem in Descartes' rule of signs? I said, look at your lecture notes. We went over this. Look at your lecture notes. Go ahead, just one page, maybe two for, two for me. I don't know what it is for you. Let's see if we can find this. See this big fat note right here? Let's read it together. So I'm going to read this for me out loud, nice and loud, play. Note. All right. So you're going to come across homework 29, and it's going to say, use the rational zero theorem in Descartes' rule of signs to get one of your zeros. They're going to give you a polynomial function. We're not going to use that. You don't have to know what the rational zero theorem is in Descartes' rule. And this was the question you asked last time, Clay. You can ignore all this stuff about the rational zero theorem in Descartes' rule of signs. What we do today in class is we're going to get a zero for our polynomial by either looking at the graph or you can look at GeoGebra. And your graph is going to give you one really nice integer zero that you can use. So you ignore that part of your homework. So this is what we're going to do now in number two. So this is what your homework's going to say. Using the rational number zero theorem and Descartes rule of signs, find a zero for this function. All right? 
We're going to completely ignore that. And if you have a graphing calculator, throw this in. And if you don't, just on when you're doing your homework, take out GeoGebra and put that in and just quick, do a quick graph of it. it. will come up very quickly. It's going to look something like this. Because what we want to do is find the exact zeros for this, not estimates, the exact zeros, even if they're irrational, even if they're complex imaginary zeros. So you have to find at least one to get going. I can't look at this and know right away one of my zeros. But my graph's telling me one right now. Can, what does my graph tell me is a zero for this function? Two, the number two. So if two comma zero is an x-intercept and x equals two is a solution to this equation when it's set equal to zero, it's also a zero of the function. All these terms we've been using simultaneously. X equals two is a solution to that equation when I set it equal to zero. It's also a zero of the function. And if I know a zero, what else do I know? What else do I know if I know a zero? An X intercept, yep. What am, I, what am I trying to do to this thing? Factor it. Do I know a factor? And what's that factor look like? X take away whatever the number is. X take away two. So what I got to figure out is what's the factor right in there? So I got a question for you. If our polynomial is a third degree and I have a linear factor out here, What's going to be the degree of the factor in here? What will be the highest power you see on it if I end up with a third? Square. And then guess what we're going to have to do? We're going to have to take that and break it into two more factors. We ha we're going to have to have three linear factors because we have a third degree. We will have three zeros. Look at your picture. You have three different zeros there. So we're going to have three different factors. The leading coefficient in your polynomial form is always the leading coefficient in your factored form. You can steal it. So we have a zero, we have a factor. Here's our factor. Now we have to use polynomial division to find the other factor. So we know our polynomial is x to the third plus x squared minus 5x minus 2. We want to divide it by x minus 2. Because whatever our answer is, that will be the missing factor that we multiply x minus 2 by to get this. So in order to find that missing factor, we have to use our long division that we did a couple of classes ago. OK, and I'm not going to go through this as slowly as when we were learning it. But if you have any questions as I go along, please stop me x goes into x cubed, x squared times. I put that right above its like place value. x squared times x minus 2 is x cubed minus 2x squared. I change both of my signs. Minus plus, that goes to 0. I have 3x squared. x goes into 3x squared. Get my blue back. x goes into, oops, I got to bring down my five minus 5x five here. x goes into 3x squared 3x three times. 3x times x minus 2 is 3x squared minus 6x. Change both of my signs when I subtract. Minus plus 0. x, bring down my minus 2. x goes into x once. 1 times x minus 2 is x minus 2. And when I subtract that, I get a 0 because they're identical. If I got anything other than 0, that would tell me I made a mistake in my long division because 2 is definitely a 0. It says it right here. So you know x minus 2 is a factor, and you should always get a 0 right here. Now we know the second factor. So if we write f of x as the product of two factors, it looks like this. x minus 2 times x squared plus 3x plus 1. But we're not done. In the old days, you would be done because you'd say, I can't factor this. 
But now that you know how to do irrational zeros and complex imaginary zeros, you're going to factor this by setting this factor equal to zero. So let's set the second factor equal to zero, just like we did in the preview exercises, to find our other factors. So A is 1 here, B is 3, and C is 1. So when I solve this equation, please, people, X equals. You're solving it by writing another equation. X equals the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of 9 minus 4 all over 2. Negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 5 all over 2. So there are your two factors. Negative 3 plus the square root of 5 over 2. Negative 3 minus the square root of 5 over 2. So what are our three zeros? 2, negative 3 plus the square root of 5 all over 2 and negative 3 minus the square root of 5 all over 2. So now when I write this in completely factored form, it looks like this. x take away one of my zeros, x take away my other zero, and x take away my third zero. That's how you always set up your factors. It's always x take away whatever your zero is. And if your zero happens to be a negative number, the subtraction will change to addition. So this becomes 1 times x take away 2. That one's done. Then x take away negative 3 plus the square root of 5 over 2. And then x take away negative 3 minus the square root of 5 over 2. OK, and you're done. Those are your three factors. Now, if you're really bored when you have that week off, you could multiply this all out. You could. And see if you can come back to where we started. That, if you can do, come back to here, your algebra is really good. All right. I know nobody's going to do that, but Amber might. I don't know. All right. So what's the degree of this original polynomial? What's the degree? It's third because it's in polynomial form, so I just look for the highest power. How many linear factors do I have? Three. How many different zeros do I have? Three. Ah, oh, we're starting to notice a pattern. Earlier, you were told this. A polynomial function has, at most, n real zeros, right? At most. It could have less than n real zeros. But now that we're looking at complex imaginary zeros, we can say every polynomial has n zeros. Not at most anymore, n zeros. Because some of them could be complex imaginary zeros. That's why we use this little c1, c2, c3. Because even real numbers are, are complex numbers. All right, so things are getting interesting. Here's the conclusion to all of this. If a polynomial function is of degree n, then counting multiple roots separately. What does that mean by multiple roots? That means like when we had that x plus 3 square, we still count negative 3 twice. We count it separately. The equation has exactly n real and non-real zeros. So whatever your degree is, that's how many zeros you should have. An nth degree polynomial can be expressed as the product of a non-zero constant. That's your leading coefficient. Your leading coefficient, that's what that means. And then n linear factors. And each factor looks like this, x take away c, where c is one of your zeros. If a plus bi is a zero, then you know what comes along for free? a minus bi, its partner. If you have irrational zeros, they also occur in pairs that are conjugate pairs. This is what we did in our preview exercises right here. So now find a third degree polynomial function with real coefficients that has negative 3 and i as zeros. The first thing that should happen when you read this is you say, third degree. I have how many zeros? 
three. How many did they list? Two. I have a missing zero. Oh, yeah. It's I and negative I. So we want to we want to find the third degree polynomial function that has negative three i and minus i as zeros. I want you to write it both in factored form and standard polynomial form. Okay. So what's the first thing someone's going to do? I hope this is the first thing I hope you do. I have to put my leading coefficient in A. I don't know the value of A yet. We're going to find it at the end. I know if it's third, a third degree, I have three linear factors. Why are they linear? Because it has a 1 as a power. And if I have it in factored form, I add 1 plus 1 plus 1. That gives me 3. Now I just pop in each of my zeros. So my first zero is a negative 3. So it's x take away a negative 3, x take away an i, and x plus an i. Oops, I suppose I should write it in all of the long gory first. x minus i and x minus a negative i. And now I can simplify this. x take away a negative 3 becomes x plus 3 x minus i, and then, of course, it's conjugate x plus i. Okay, I have factored this. I still don't know what a is. How the heck am I going to find the value of a? Right here f of 1 equals 8 tells me a point on my polynomial function. When x is 1, y is 8. f of 1 is 8. So f of 1 is the same as 8, so I put my 8 for my y value, and I replace all my x's with a 1. So my first factor is 1 plus 3, that's a 4. And now I have to figure out what is 1 take away i times 1 plus i. Are they conjugates of each other's, folks? When you multiply conjugates, you get the difference of the first term squared and the second term squared. My 1 gets squared, my i gets squared. Oh, what's i squared again? Negative 1. So this becomes 1 plus 1, which is 2. So when I multiply these two factors, I get a 2. I did all that work. What's the value for a? 8 equals 8a. What's the value for a? 1. Shoot, I did all that work, and it's not even an exciting number like negative 1 over 160 or something. Okay, so you just replace that a with 1. You've now satisfied this part of your instructions, your factored form. What do I do to get my polynomial form? Multiply my factors, so let's do that. Okay. To do that, I need another little page here. 1 times x plus, was this right, x plus 3? Am I remembering this right? x minus i x plus i. Well, what's going to be the easiest things to multiply first? The conjugates. Do these two first. This is your associative property. When you multiply three things, you can do any two first. Multiply that first, you get x squared plus 1. But you get x squared minus i squared, which is x squared plus 1. And then you multiply this by x plus 3. And you get x to the third plus 3x squared plus x plus 3. And you're done. That's your polynomial form. Voila. And folks, I want to show you something once you get that written down. See this 
you can factor this easily without going through all that long division by a technique called grouping. If you group these two together, then you group these two together. What's the greatest common factor for x cubed plus 3x squared? x squared. If you pull that out front, what you have left is x plus 3. Notice this factor is x plus 3. It has a 1 in front of it. Now, when you look at these two separately, and I ask you, what's the greatest common factor between these two square boxes? What would be the common factor they both have? What factor do you see in both of them? Pull it out. And when you pull it out of here, what's left? X squared. When you pull it out of here, what's left is 1. And then to factor x squared plus 1, you can do it one of two ways. You can either remember that the sum of two perfect squares looks like this, the square root of each one, conjugates, or you can set this equal to zero, like this. And I'm doing this for a reason. Because when you get that quadratic equation, what do you always forget? Plus and minus. You square root both sides. You have a 2 there. You have to get two answers. Square root of x squared is really the absolute value of x. And the square root of negative 1 is i. But x could be a positive i or a negative i. Always get two answers. This will help you with the very first class activity, which you have 24 minutes to do. Okay, have fun. Use your flags with any questions. Glad to help you out.